The Star of Christmas. Written by Cindy Kenny. Illustrated by Dennis Bredow. Based on the video, The Star of Christmas. Created by Phil Vischer and Tim Hodge. Are you ready? Here we go. Seymour Schwenk, may we Seymour Schwenk zoomed through the streets of London. His rocket engine backfired as he zipped along. People stared. Horses neighed. Seymour was causing quite a ruckus. London in 1880 had never seen anything like it. As he pulled up in front of the theater and hopped out of his peculiar contraption, he was met by Millward Phelps and Cavus Appythart. They were very anxious to meet him. Millward admired Seymour's rocket-powered invention as Cavus talked about their upcoming production of The Princess and the Plumber, a musical spectacular scheduled to open in just three days on Christmas Eve. Wow. Spying the package that Seymour was carrying, Millward asked, Cavus, what's in the box? Well, in this modern age, it isn't just enough to have a great it isn't enough to have to just have a great story, Cavus explained. No, you need to show the audience something they've never seen before. You got a monkey that can yodel? Millward asked. <laughs> a monkey that can yodel? I've never heard of anything more ridiculous than that. <laughs> anyway. No, Millward. Electric lights. Spectacles, the name of the game, Cavus explained. But Cavus knew it wouldn't be enough to just have spectacular lights for the big show. He knew that any show would, worth seeing in London was attended by Prince Frederick. Not only was Frederick heir to the, th heir to the throne, but he was also London's number one theater critic. A good word from him, and the show was sure to be a success. Cavus and Millward stood, stood back to stare up at the marquee of the theater. They were mesmerized by the bigness of what they were about to do. Tell London a wonderful story about a sad princess and a kindly plumber and the power of love. Wow! Cavus said as he backed right into a lamppost with a poster advertising another Christmas program. This other program was going to be held at St. Bart's, a local church. It was a new Christmas production at St. Bart's, and it was also going to be performed on Christmas Eve. I'm going over to St. Bart's and see what's going on, said Cavus as he hurried off. Cavus stood at the back of St. Bart's as he watched six-year-old Edmund Gilbert with, and watched as six-year-old Edmund Gilbert was busy getting ready for that, for that Christmas pageant. Reverend Gilbert, Edmund's dad, also watched as his son barked out orders and tried to corral all the manpower he could, he could to make his production bigger and better than ever. But his dad explained that the show didn't have to be a huge spectacle because the story of Christmas is so simple and powerful all by itself. But Edmund wasn't so sure. He had 20 pounds of glitter to make sure his message shone through. When Edmund's dad explained that there was a family across town who needed help, Edmund was quite disappointed that his dad couldn't stay around to help with the pageant. Helping people in need is more important, Edmund. That's what God did on Christmas. He came to earth to help us and to show us how much he loved us. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us, his dad explained. 
I need to help this family first, then I'll be back. Oh, by the way, the church committee decided that you can use the Star of Christmas in your program if you're very careful with it, Reverend Gilbert added as he turned to leave. You will find it in the cabinet by the communion supplies. Cabas laughed. He'd seen enough. <laughs> it's just a bunch of kids putting on a church play. Don't know, don't know why I was so worried, he muttered as he turned to leave. But I do wonder what the star of Christmas is. Cavus didn't have to wonder for long. The next day, the London Post-Gazette sent me read, St. Gregory the Great gave the star to the monks at Canterbury in, on August 5th. On, on August 14th, 592. It is a very special star and hasn't been publicly displayed for years. Wow, we should go, Millward said when he and Cavus saw the story on the front page of the Gazette. This was big news. He had forgotten all about their own show. Cavus tried not to worry. After all, the prince was still coming to their show. And any show worth seeing in London simply had to have Prince Frederick in attendance. But just then the phone rang. It was the prince informing Cavus and Millward that he would no longer be attending the princess and the plumber because he was going to see the star. Cavus began to panic. We need a lot more lights, he declared. But then he got another idea. Hmm. I'm not sure it's a good idea. After Reverend Gilbert left the church and the church caretaker, Moyer the Destroyer, went to bed, a red shape slowly rose up between two pews and whispered, Okay, Millward, I think it's clear. I don't feel very good about stealing the star, Millward mumbled as they made their way over to the cabinet where the star had been stored. Oh no, we're not stealing the star, we're just borrowing it, Cavus said. Besides, we're doing this for London. They're practically begging us to borrow it. I don't hear them, Millward said as he looked around to see if someone was talking. M Metaphorically speaking, Cavus said nervously. They carefully pulled a case out of the cabinet that held the star and gazed inside. It looks like a turtle, Millward said. Well, yes, I suppose if you look at it that way, but back then, I'm sure it was quite exquisite, Cavus answered. It looks like a turtle, he said, trying to look at it from a different angle. I don't care if it looks like a chicken on a bicycle. This is what the prince wants to see, so this is what we're putting in our show. Cavus whispered as he helped Millward slip it into his bag. Bad idea, Cavus. Bad idea. Silently, they crept back toward the door. Then it happened. Crash! The cloth holding the fancy communion plates caught on the bag they were carrying. The communion plates clattered onto the stone floor and wobbled about. Cavus and Millward jumped. Who's there? Came a voice from, back, from the back of the church building. Let's get out of here! Cavus and Millward shouted to one another as they ran for the door. When Cavus and Millward discovered the back doors of the church were locked, they made a mad dash up the stairs. They hurried through an through an area covered with scaffolds, ladders, and winches being used to refurbish the bell tower. You're going to be singing out of the other side of your nose when I'm through with you, you slimy sea donkeys, the caretaker bellowed after them. As they reached the landing, Cavus spotted a wooden platform hanging from a rope attached to a pulley hanging from the tower. This must be an elevator, Cavus thought as he hopped up onto the platform, but the block of wood that kept the platform from falling popped loose, and the rope began to spin. Cavus plunged down the tower, screaming for help. 
A red blur whooshed past the caretaker, causing him to do a double take, causing him to do a double take, spin around, and head back down the stairs. Huh? You can't get away from me, wee tomato. I'll chase you all the way to Yorkshire if I have to. Cavus hit the bottom. Cavus hit bottom with a loud bang. A big cloud of dust billowed up around him. Are you okay, Cavus? Millward called, leaning over the railing. But Millward had leaned. But Millward leaned so far over the rail he knocked a board out from under a shelf, holding three huge bells. Millward ducked as the bells whizzed by his head and landed heavily in a basket tied to the other end of Cavus's rope. Now the heavy basket plunged down the tower. Now the heavy basket plunged down the tower, pulling Cavus skyward with incredible speed. Once again, the caretaker caught sight of a red blur going up as going up as he hurried down the stairs. Huh? Me? Huh? That's the last straw, yo-yo tomato, he called after Cavus. At the top, Cavus jumped off the platform and landed right next to Millward. Cavus, are you okay? You fell down, and then you fell up. Speak to me, Millward wailed. Cavus was amazingly unhurt. He quickly shook off his wooziness as he and Millward headed toward a ladder propped up against a wall. They scrambled up the ladder with the caretaker close behind. Don't even think you can get away. You're trapped like a bug on, a, on the queen's sticky buns, he called after them. You're trapped like me mother's meatloaf at a church picnic. Millward leaned back to look at the caretaker. As Millward leaned back to look at the caretaker, the ladder began tipping away from the wall. Don't lean back, Millward. The caretaker's eyes followed their flight backward from the wall and right out of the bell tower. Ah! Cavus and Millward screamed. With a loud thud, Cavus and Millward landed in a laundry cart resting at the bottom of the tower walls. As they lay beneath the laundry catching their breath, the cart began rolling down a steep winding hill. Are we moving? Cavus asked as the speeding cart disappeared around a curve in the road. His question was answered with a thunderous crash. The next day, the cast of The Princess and the Plumber stared at Millward and Cavus as they entered the theater. They were bandaged and bruised. Okay, everybody, Cavus called out, trying not to notice that everyone was staring at them. Way pretending not to notice that everyone was staring at them. I want to see the final dress rehearsal of the spectacular closing number with lights and the you know what. Everyone scurried into, pos into position as the music began. Slowly and quite dramatically, the fairy peas were lowered on tiny swings covered with little light bulbs. With her crown and with his wrench, he a Brit and she so French, never more to smell the stench of plugged up love. They sang as Cavus watched excitedly. They will come from near and far to see a love shine like a star. Oh, look. It's beautiful. The cast members gazed in delight as Seymour grabbed a rope and the star was lowered. Millward still thought it looked a lot like a turtle. Okay, time for the lights, Cavus beamed. Seymour threw switches and the entire stage came alive with light. I don't know, this seems like a bad idea. Then with a final tug, Seymour threw the last switch. This time there was a loud pop 
followed by several smaller pops. The lights flickered. Everyone glanced nervously around. Seymour looked on in horror as two wires shorted out, starting a fire that quickly spread to the theater's curtain. With lightning speed, the flame spread. Cast members shrieked and ran as Cavus cried out, The star! Being forced to leave without it. Being forced to leave without it. The fire spread so quickly that the entire stage was soon engulfed in flames. Cavus and Millward sat on the sidewalk in front of the burned-out theater looking forlorn. The show's gone. The star's gone. The theater's gone. I guess things can't get any worse, Cavus mumbled miserably. Uh, I wouldn't say that, Cavus. Seriously, haven't people learned never to say that? Just then, they heard, It's them, Constable! The vicious hooligans that stole the Star of Christmas! Before they knew what had happened, Cavus and Millward heard the cell doors being slammed shut with a noisy clang. See, I told you not to say that. Every time someone says that things can't get worse, it gets worse. So, take my advice, people. Never say that things can't get worse. Because right at that moment, that's what happens. Things get worse. Christmas Eve in jail. That wasn't part of the plan, Cavus moaned. I just wanted to teach London to love. Cavus and Millward continued to to comfort each other as Charles Pincher, a tough-looking con man, emerged from the shadows of their cell. Teach London to love, Charles asked. Now how exactly were you going to do that? Cavus hopped off his bunk and over to the bars. With a big stage show, with great songs and costumes, and lots of lights, Charles leaned back into the shadows and began to laugh. <laughs> Teach London to love with light bulbs. <laughs> You're more likely to teach a horse to fly than teach this city to love. Or any city for that matter. Hasn't anyone ever been nice to you? Cavus asked. Oh, sure, any bloke will be nice to you when he wants something from you. But that ain't love. Helping someone who needs help when you won't get nothing back. Now that's love, Charles told them. But I ain't ever seen anything like that. Leastwise, not round here. Teach London to love with light bulbs. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> he chuckled mockingly. Cavus and Millward were thoroughly depressed. But then a door opened. Me, but then a door opened, and much to their surprise. In walked Reverend Gilbert and his son, Edmund. I guess you're pretty mad about the star, huh? Cavus groaned. Well, go ahead. Yell away. We're getting what we deserve. We aren't here to yell at you, the Reverend explained. Actually, it was Edmund's idea to come here. I've been teaching him about Christmas, that God loved us so much he sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus came to help us when, even when we didn't deserve it, just because he loved us. Cavus and Millward looked at each other. They didn't understand what was happening. I mean, what was happening? We wanted to do the same thing for you. We aren't going to press charges, Edmund beamed. The faces of Cavus and Millward slowly lit up as the doors of the police station burst open and they were set free to walk back out into the streets of London. But back in his cell, Charles Pincher groaned. He was just plain confused. Well, since we don't have anything else to do, we can come see your pageant, Cavus told them. That's when the Reverend explained that they couldn't possibly get there in time for the show. The Reverend and Edmund had given up the pageant just to help Cavus and Millward so they wouldn't have to spend Christmas in jail. 
How nice. I mean, I wouldn't want anyone to spend Christmas in jail either. Then, a familiar clanking sound distracted them. Seymour drove up in his rocket carriage, and Millward had an idea. Since there weren't any other options, Seymour agreed to let them borrow his contraption to get them to the church on time. Let me get this straight, Millward said hurriedly. Me hurried, me, Millward said hurriedly, re, me, reviewing Seymour's directions. Rockets one to four have been used up to get here. Five to ten have to get us there. And under no circumstances are we to use rocket 11 because it hasn't been tested. Okay, hang on, everybody. Millward fired up rocket five, and with him, fumb wait, fumbling... And with him fumbling with the steering control, they zoomed down the street, scattering people. You don't know how to steer it? Cavus asked, his eyes opened wide with fear. I forgot to ask, Millward howled. Hurtling forward out of control, they crashed through a wagon filled with ladies' hats. Then they plowed through a bakery and came out the other end, adorned with various pastries. Millward! Cavus yelled as they smashed through the front door. The carriage zoomed out the back with the passengers now sporting bankers' hats. Then they were shocked to see a real live banker seated beside them. Everyone cheered as they zipped down the last street toward the drawbridge that crossed the Thames River. But the last rocket fizzled and died just as the drawbridge began to rise. We're not completely out of rockets, Millward told them as he as his eyes lingered on the lever marked number eleven. Millward, no, don't do it. The show must go on, he shouted as he fired the forbidden rocket. The back of the carriage began to rumble. The terrified passengers shook like a group of astronauts in a rocket on a launch pad. Then suddenly, vroom, the carriage took off like a, well, like a rocket. It flew off the bridge and streaked down the, str down the street at the height of the rooftops. Guests were arriving for the pageant as the carriage descended and bounced loudly through the streets near the church's property. Blurs of colors whizzed by the prince, and whizzed by the prince as the veggies flew down the aisle and landed at the front of the church sanctuary. Thinking that the show had begun, the audience began to applaud. But you don't have the Star of Christmas, Cavus whispered as, to Edmund as he stood to start the show. Sure we do, Edmund answered. You didn't steal the real Star of Christmas. That's not something you can steal. In fact, it isn't something at all. It's someone, someone very special. Everyone turned to look at the small manger on the stage. Cavus and Millward smiled as they realized Edmund was talking about Jesus, the true star of Christmas. He certain that's certainly what he is. Jesus is the true star of Christmas. <laughs> Can you guys help me out? Edmund asked as Cavus and Millward. Edmund asked Cavus and Millward. I do need a new star of Bethlehem. Yeah, we can handle that, Cavus answered as they hurried off stage. The pageant began as Edmund narrated and the audience hung on every hung on very word. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to shepherds living out in the fields. They said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Backstage, Cavus snapped into action. The sound of a squeaky pulley echoed through the church as Millward appeared on stage. Wearing a heavily glittered star costume, he rose up from behind the manger scene. We pulled skyward by the same pulley used in the bell tower. And all this took place to fulfill what the prophet had said. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us, Edmund read on. The music swelled, and the audience roared with approval and applause. Hmm, I think I understand, Cavus exclaimed to Reverend Gilbert, who was standing beside him. There's only one story that can really show us how to love, and this is it. Good for you, Cavus. As soon as you understand what as soon as you understand what God did for us that first Christmas and how much he loves us, it makes you want to share that love with everyone. The reverend explained. We did it, Cavus said gleefully. We brought love to we brought love to London on Christmas. The cast gathered together to take a bow as Edmund called, called backstage for Cavus to join them. Forgetting about his role as Millward's counterweight, Cavus eagerly hopped off his, plat his platform, causing his board to quickly rise. Ah! Millward hollered as he fell with a loud crash. The audience gasped. <gasps> I'm okay. Millward called to the greatly relieved audience who resumed their ovation. After the show, the caretaker came down the aisle yelling, Hold on a second! Look what I found! Cavus and Millward held their breath as he carefully opened a square box. They opened a square box that revealed the beautiful star of Christmas. It was in me sock drawer all along. I set out the wrong box he told a delighted crowd who had gathered to see the star. If that's the star, what did we take? Cabus asked. Our other famous relic, the Turtle of Damascus, he chuckled. Not nearly as valuable. In fact, most experts say it's a hoax. I thought it looked like a turtle, said Millward. Back at the police station, the jail door leading to Charles Pincher's cell creaked open. Charles' eyes widened as Cavus and Millward hopped toward his cell, carrying brightly wrapped packages, food, and colorful Christmas decorations. Charlie didn't know what to say. Was this all for him? Soon, his dark cell was transformed into a, Festus Chris into a festive Christmas party. And the presents and food were as the presents and food were brought out, Charlie's cold, hard face melted slowly into a warm one with a big smile. From out on the street, the little jail cell glowed with enough love, it seemed, to light all of London. Merry Christmas, Mr. Pincher, Cavus said, smiling warmly. Merry Christmas indeed. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, 
shall come to thee, O Israel. She will give birth to a child, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. The end. What did you learn from this story? And remember, there's only one story that can teach us how to love. And the story of Jesus is the one. See you later. Bye.